Okay, so now I'm going to talk about, uh, so this second module is going to be about uh, views and spaces. So what are the uh, Cocos views, right? So we create them, what should you use it? And basically this is the uh, data structures from Cocos. Um, I talked about uh, memory and execution space. It controls where the data is living, on the GPU or on the CPU and where you execute your code. And then finally, we talked about uh, the memory access pattern. Uh, and so that's very important uh, for performance. So first view, uh, so the goal here is the motivation about it. It's some key concepts, some of the template parameters that you have and the view lifecycle. So it's basically the basis basics about the view. Uh, there are some more advanced concepts. Uh, I think we'll do it them tomorrow. Okay, so let's say that you want to do, um, you know, vector add on the, on the GPU. So you can uh, write that uh, using a parallel for and a, a lambda function. Uh, or you can use, you know, uh, a functor to do it. So you would allocate the memory and then just give that the pointer to the functor. So let's say you try that, what's going to happen? It won't work, right? And the issue here is we have allocate, allocated the, uh, the memory on the host. And so when we try to access it on the GPU, well, we can't do it and we get an error. So, the solution around that that's been developed in Cocos, it's a view. And so the view will allow you to allocate and move memory to the GPU or, or to the host. So a view, it's a lightweight C++ class, which has a pointer to an array of data and some metadata. Um, metadata is, for example, it's going to be things like size and some a label. Uh, it's uh, it's a templated on the type. Um, so if we go back to the previous case, right, we've replaced uh, our simple array with a view of a double. Uh, one thing to think about it, it's a view, it really behaves like a pointer. So you want to copy them. You do not want to uh, pass them by reference, right? It's very important when you give a pointer to the functor or to your kernels, you have to do it by co copy, not by reference. And I'll explain more in details why later. So the views, uh, it's a multidimensional array of size, so it's zero up into eight. So size zero is just a scalar. Size one, we have a vector, size two a matrix, you know, and so on. Uh, the number of dimension is fixed at compile time. So you cannot, you know, declare a view as a matrix and then decide it to change it to uh, be a vector, right? It's decided at compile time. And it's a rectangular array, right? So if you have a matrix, you cannot have something like first row has 10 elements and second row has 11, and then the next row has nine. They all have to have the same number of elements. They all have to have like 10 elements per row. And the same thing with columns, right? So it's it's fixed like that. Uh, and the size of the dimension, right? That you can decide either at compile time or at runtime. You, and you can mix them, right? So here we have an example. We have a view. And so it's a three-dimensional view of double. Uh, when we have like a you know a star, that means that it's a compile, uh, it's a runtime uh, size. And when you just give the number, then it's a compile time. So in the first case here, we have you know uh, a view of three D, a three D view of doubles, and the three dimensions are given at runtime, right? So we have to give we give a label. And then we have to give uh, the size and zero and one and two. In the second case, we have two dimensions uh, that are given at 
runtime and the last one at compile time. So you only have to give two dimension. Here we have uh, two dimension at compile time, one at runtime, so only you have one. And if everything is given at uh, compile time, there is nothing to give. So these stars are nothing to do with a pointer, right? Do not think that, oh, I see double and then three stars, that means, you know, I have a pointer, a pointer, a pointer. That's nothing to do it. It's just to represent that it's um, it's a runtime value. No, the runtime dimension always come first. So you, for example, you cannot have N2 and then star stars. This will not work. You cannot have a star and one star. They won't work. Okay, and so to access the data, though, that's uh, basically what you would expect. You use the uh, parentheses operator. So the allocations uh, are always explicit. So we, there is a you know some cost uh, of performing an allocation, and so Cocos does not hit any of that. It will always uh, you will have to do it yourself. Now, when you do a copy constructor or when you do an assignment, this is a shallow copy. And so think about it as a pointer. If you assign a pointer to the uh, to another one, they both point to the same data, right? They both point to the same uh, memory uh, data, right? You don't have a copy of the data. So it's the same here. And that's why you also want to pass everything by value, not by reference. Uh, among the metadata that a view has, he has an um, uh, allocation counter. And so when that allocation goes to zero, we automatically deallocate the memory. So if you want to see the view as a share pointer, you have already like a you know, pretty good representation of what it is. It behaves like a share pointer, and there's just a few extra more things on top of it. So with that being said here, we have an example. So it's a 2D view. Um, the first dimension is given at runtime, and then we have a size of five. So we are create two different uh, views, one A with size N, and then there's one B size K. We assign them. Then we create a new view C. Everything is given, uh, the dimensions are given at runtime. And then we try to assign, and then we need to print the value here. So what are we going to get, right? Because uh, we just said it's everything behaves like a pointer, you know, we get the last value, we get three. Um, so what happened exactly? So when we are here in this space, right, we allocate A and we allocate B. Now, when you do the assignment here, we are going to decrement the number of A and we are going to deallocate A. And A is just going to be a shallow copy of B. So what that means is if you ask the level you know, of A you know, at this point, it will return B. It won't return A because this is, you know, this is not the case anymore. It's not its own allocation. The label is associated to the allocation. There is no allocation anymore. It's only the B allocation. So the level of A at this point is B. Now, when we create C, again, it's a shallow copy of B. Uh, and so if you ask the label of C, you'll get B as the value. And something to point to notice here, it's, you know, here B, it's one runtime, one compile time, and C, it's two compile time, and, you know, that works. So what are some of the, you know, metadata you can access to. Um, so you can access the view, uh, the size of the view, and this is done through the function called extend dim. So if you get, you know, extend zero, uh, you get the first dimension, extend one, the second, and so on. And if you have something that's done at compile time, you can also use static extend. Uh, you can get the underlying row pointer you know, using data. So that is basically you know, the same as you have a stood vector. You can also get the row pointer using data and you can access the label using well label. So this is just some example of it. Um, yeah, so we already have uh, 
the second exercise. Um, it's pretty short, I think. Um, okay, let's keep on. Um, so we just talk about the basics of the view. Uh, next, we'll talk about uh, memory space, which is where the data uh, resides. Uh, the deep copy, which is you know how we'll move the data around, and the layout. Uh, there are memory traits and subviews. These are things that uh, we won't do today. So now we'll talk about uh, execution and memory space. Um, and so the execution space, you know, it's used to know where uh, the code is going to run, and the memory space is where. Uh, the data is, and uh, we'll talk about how to avoid illegal memory access and how to uh, move the data around. Uh, we'll briefly explain why you need to initialize and finalize, and unfortunately, you have to add some uh, macro to your code uh, to make it work both on the CPU and the GPU, and uh, we'll explain why. So here we have, you know, our, our node. Um, the, there is, you know, many things on the node. There's some core on the CPU core. There's an accelerator, right? And the execution space will allow you to decide where it runs. Do I run on the CPU? And if it's on the CPU, do I run that in serial? Or do I use OpenMP? And or he does it run on the, the GPU. And now I'm going to use CUDA, I'm going to use heap, uh, open ACC, sickle, right? This is what the execution space allows you to do. It allows you uh, to choose. So in general, your code will look like this. Uh, you know, you have some code, let's say some IO, and then you have something you want to do in parallel. Okay. So the host code, that's going to be always on the CPU, right? So you're doing your IO on the CPU. Now, what you have in your, say, your parallel code, where is it going to run, right? Is it going to run on the CPU or is it going to run on the GPU? If you look at this, uh, there's no way you know, to decide why it's done. And so it's done on the default execution space. So the default execution space, it's something that you know, Cocos kind of decides um, depending on how you've compiled it, right? So if you've compiled Cocos with a GPU backend, let's say CUDA, this is going to be your default. If you didn't compile with a GPU backend, but you compiled with multi-trailing, let's say OpenMP, then it would be OpenMP as your default execution space. And if you have no backend uh, enabled, it will be just serial. So how do you, can you control, right? You can control the default uh, at compilation, right? So if you have a version of Cocos that's compiled with uh, CUDA, and then you have another version of Cocos that's compiled with OpenMP, but not CUDA, depending on which one you link to, you will go to use CUDA or OpenMP. The other way is to specify the execution space in the policy. So, so far what we've done is, you know, we've just given, you know, just use an integer, but Instead of giving an integer, you can use a range policy. So this means just, you know, a range policy, just like a 1D regular loop. And you have to give an execution space. And then, you know, you say you're going to go from zero to the number of interval. Uh, one thing to note here, it's the execution space. It's a template parameter. So it has to be known at compile time. This is not something, you know, that you can do at runtime. Uh, what happens when you don't give an explicit uh, range policy, but you just give the integer, basically that's equivalent to use the range policy when you omit the template parameter, right? This is what we've shown so far. So there's a few requirements. So Cocos must be compiled with the ex execution space enabled. So if you compile with, you know, CUDA, and serial, and that's it. You cannot decide that your open execution space is going to be OpenMP. You have to have compiled uh, Cocos with OpenMP supported. Now, 
all the execution space needs to be initialized and finalized. So you have to call Cocos init and Cocos, uh, Cocos initialized and Cocos finalized. Uh, and that's because, um, you know, we, we have some arrays, you have some data that we initialize. So these things kind of works like a, an open MP uh, init and finalize. Uh, and so, yeah, think about it, uh, that's very similar. One thing is you cannot, once you have finalized, you cannot reinitialize Cocos, right? So you cannot have initialize, finalize, and then try to initialize it again. It will not work. Um, functions uh, must be marked with a macro for the CPU, uh, for the GPU and the Lambda also. Uh, let me think, think explain here. So basically, uh, everything that needs to be compiled uh, and a function that needs to be compiled on the GPU, you need the host device, uh, you know, keywords to make them work. Now, you don't want this if if uh, your compiler does not support uh, CUDA, right? Then you won't know what's the device and host thing, and so it will, it will complain. And so we have this Cocos inline function, and depending on uh, what uh, backend you've enabled, it will expand just to inline or to inline device host. We also have a Cocos function where there is no inline. So any function that you want to be able to run on a GPU, you need to have, you know, this, this macro in front of it, right? You need the Cocos function. It's the same with uh, Lambda, right? You need to use Cocos Lambda. So the Cocos Lambda is going to do a capture by value. And if you're on the CUDA or on heap, it will also expand to the device host. If you don't have that, you cannot run on GPU. So that's something it's, you know, it's not very complicated, but it has to propagate through your uh, entire code. So let's uh, get back to our example. Now, instead of, uh, allocating memory on the host, we allocate a view. Uh, we still want to do, you know, read from file on the host, so we call a regular for, and then we want to execute the parallel reduce, uh, let's say, on the GPU, okay? So now the question is, why is the data store, right? Is it on the GPU? Is it on the CPU? Do we have copies of both, right? Because this part happens on the CPU, and this part happens on the GPU. And so you can control where the memory is thanks to the memory space. So if you go back to our node, right, you see we have different kind of memory. We have the on package memory, which is on the CPU. You have the on package memory, but on the GPU, you have RAM, you have you know, many kinds of uh, different place where you have memories and the memory space will dictate where, you know, the data is allocated. So every view um, stores data in the memory space. And again, this is decided at compile time, not at runtime. And so in the view, you know, there is an extra template parameter called the memory space, right? Then there's different kind of it. There is like host space, it's going to be your CPU. You have the CUDA space, you have CUDA UVM, uh, you have heap, so, so on, right? There is a bunch of them. Now, each execution space also has a default memory space, right? And so, for example, uh, if uh, you're running on CUDA, uh, I think the default memory space, if I remember correctly, just the CUDA space, right? So I don't think it's CUDA, it's not CUDA UVM anymore. And so you can actually, because every um, execution space has a default memory space, instead of giving a memory space to the view, you can also give an execution space to the view. And you know, we'll get the default memory space associated with it. And so when you don't provide a memory space, what happens is we look at the default execution space and then take the default memory space associated to the default execution space. 
So another way to see it, when you just do a view double and you don't put the memory space, we look at, we take div, the default execution space, and that we get the memory space associated to it. Okay, so in practice, what does it look like when you allocate a view on the host, right? So you have your metadata on the CPU and in the metadata, you have a pointer to the allocated data, which also is on the CPU, right? So the, just to remind you, the metadata is like the extent, like the dimension, it's uh, like a label and there's like a counter to know if you know, we can deallocate the view or not. When you allocate a view uh, on CUDA, the metadata still exists on the CPU, but the data itself is allocated on the GPU. That means that from the CPU, you can ask the extent of the view, right? Because that metadata is on the CPU, not on the GPU. You cannot difference, though, um, your view. You cannot try to access an element. If you try to access an element of the view on the CPU, you will get an illegal uh, address uh, error, right? Because the CPU cannot read the data from the GPU. So how does you know, a regular um, kernel works? So you declare your view. Right, you allocate them. Then, if you use a bank uh, functor, you need to uh, inst instantiate your functor. Then you launch the kernel using a parallel for or parallel reduce. The functor is copied to the device. We run the kernel, and then the copy of the functor is released. So there is no deep copy of the data. Right, C3D works like a pointer. So. Here's an example. You have a, a view that's set in CUDA, so I allocate the view. So the metadata exists on the CPU, the data used on the GPU. Once I launch the kernel, the metadata is going to be copied to the GPU. And so at this point, no, I can ask the extent uh, of uh, the of uh, the view on the GPU, and I can also, you know, access the the data. So here's another example uh, where you have two views: one the on CUDA, one on the host. When you allocate the two views, both have their metadata on the host, but the data for the host is on the host, and for CUDA, it's on the GPU. Once you launch your kernel, the metadata is copied back. It's copied to the GPU. And so what you see is my metadata for my host view exists on the GPU. So on the GPU, I cannot ask what's the size, what's the extent of my host view. You know, that will work. But you cannot access the host view because the host, the data itself is only on the CPU. Okay, so if we go back to our example before, right? Know that we know how to give the a memory space. I can create a view and create the view and say, okay, I want this to be on the in the on the GPU. Now the problem is this line, right? This is done on the CPU, and so I cannot do it. I won't have access to the data. Okay. We say, okay, well, then I'll use the host view for that. So this fixes it. No, I can read my array. But obviously, the issue is not here because when I'm launching my uh, kernel on the GPU, my data is on the CPU. I cannot access it. Okay, so what can we do about that? Uh, one thing is to use CUDA UVM. Um, CUDA UVM basically will take care of that. It will automatically move the data for you. Uh, there is a host pin. Uh, we're not talking about that today. And then there is mirroring. And so mirroring is when you really move the data yourself. 
So here, let's just talk quickly about uh, the CUDA UVM. So CUDA UVM, uh, uh, on all the GPU, on all the NVIDIA GPU, and I think uh, on uh, Windows machine, what happens is when you ask for array and you use CUDA UVM, you really literally have two uh, data, the, the two arrays are allo allocated, one on the CPU, one on the GPU. Now, if you are using a most you know, modern GPU, it's only allocated in one place. And when you need it on the other place, you have a page fold and the data is migrated, right? So you don't need to take care of, about it. Uh, so this is, you know, obviously very nice. It's very easy. There is a, a performance hit, right? So when you have a page fold, you know, this is slower than simply copying the data. And uh, so that's something, you know, you have to keep in mind. This is not as efficient as you do it by hand. And another thing that happens, uh, that's happened to me also a few times, is you use CUDA UVM, you, you know, you move most of the code using Cocos and like a parallel for parallel reduce. And then there's like one or two loops you forgot to, you know, update them. They are still using a regular for loop. And every time you're just moving back to the CPU, right? And you don't realize it because the code works and you have, you know, an okay speed up. So that's, you know, something to be aware of. Now, the important concept now is the mirror. So the, a mirror is really a view uh, that's the same as one that you allocated, but that lives in a different memory space, right? So here, let's say we have a view that we have allocated on the GPU. What we are going to do is create a mirror view, and this one is going to live on the CPU, right? So it will have the same type, it will have the same size. And so you can basically do a deep copy from one to the other. So I can take my view and deep copy it uh, in my uh, host view, right? And I can now access it on the CPU and then I can do a deep copy to move it back to the GPU. Uh, so yeah, usually, you know, a workflow will work like this you create your view uh, on the on your like let's say CUDA space then you create your host view so know that the host view exists on the uh, CPU you populate the host view then you do a deep copy to move all of that data all of that data to the GPU you launch your kernel you, you know, work on your view and then now you move the data back to the CPU using uh, another deep copy. So this is, you know, a, the normal workflow of the Cocos. So now you're wondering, so what happens if I have a host view, right? If my, if I don't have a GPU enable, what happens? Well, in this case, when you're going to create the, me the mirror view, nothing is going to be it, right? If um, the space that you're using uh, can be accessed from the CPU, nothing happens. Uh, and so that also means that when you do the deep copy, this is a no op, right? So there is no cost to it. If you really need uh, to have, you know, allocate memory, then you have to use create, create mirror. Right, then in that case, you will always allocate a new data. If you just use create, create mirror view, you will allocate uh, data only if you cannot access it. Now, this is just allocate the data. You still need to do the deep copy yourself. We don't do a deep copy, you know, uh, hidden. Okay, so now uh, this is uh, the next exercise. Um, yeah, let's, you should uh, play a little bit with the view. So I guess another like uh, maybe 10 minutes again. So we'll take back, okay, let's keep on. Um, 
So just a quick summary about the view uh, and space sections, right? So the the view you really have to see that as a share pointer towards to a multimedia module array, and you can pick where the memory is going to be allocated. Uh, the view abstracts away, you know, the different kind of allocation, right? If you are uh, allocating memory on the NVIDIA GPU, you want to do Kumalock. If it's an AMD GPU, it's going to be heap malloc, right? All those kind of things, you know, it's hidden from you. And this is obviously, you know, very useful when you have a heterogeneous node with CPU and GPU. And to be able to move the data around, you want to use the mirroring. Um, you know, when you have CPU and GPU, you also have more than one execution space, and that allows you to decide, am I going to run this part of the code, you know, using OpenMP on the CPU, and maybe this part of the code, I will do it uh, on the GPU. All of that has to be decided, though, at compile time. So... One thing we haven't talked about yet, it's how the memory is uh, laid out. Um, so how do we access the memory will have a huge impact on the performance, right? And so we are going to discuss why it is different from the, on the CPU and the GPU, and you know what are some of the effects. So let's go back uh, to our inner product, right? Uh, with two vectors and matrix. Now the question is, how should I lay the memory for the matrix, right? There is like, you know, two most common ways to do it. One is uh, column majors and row majors. Mm. And basically the row major, uh, the, the column major is like, when I go to the next element in my memory, I'm going to my next row and uh, Row major, it's when I go to the next element in my memory, it's the next column that I'm uh, accessing, right? So here we call them a uh, layout left and layout right. Uh, I think layout left, it's also what's done more like, uh, you know, in Fortran and layout right is what's done in C++, where you want to move the fastest on the rightmost uh, index instead of the most left index. So this has a very, uh, so it's very important uh, for the performance, and it's one against decided by uh, uh, template parameters, and it's again decided at compile time. So you have this layout uh, template parameters. This has to be you know, given before the space, but you don't have to give it, right? So the most common uh, layout, like I just say, it's left, where the you know you stride of one in the memory when you move on the leftmost index. And layout right, you start of one in the rightmost index. Uh, if you don't say anything, we just pick the default. So on the CUDA, it's layout left. A on the CPU is going to be layout right. Now you can write your own layout if you want to. Um, it's quite cumbersome at the moment. Once uh, will you we will switch um, to use. Uh, and span underneath in the Cocos view, that would be a lot easier. But currently, you know, if you need to write your own layout, just, you know, let us know because you're, it's quite uh, complicated. So there are others layouts that are uh, also available as tried and filed. I won't talk about them today. Um, I will skip the exercise because we don't have time. Uh, so this is just some example where we just change the layout, right? So we do the inner product, but we use different layout for the matrix. So the it's in an old slide, but it's still uh, relevant. And so what you can see is you see huge difference. So this is the Pascal. You get really good performance when you have a left uh, layout, and then with the right, it's really poor. But if you look on the CPU side, it's the opposite. You get the best results uh, with the right layout and the worst with the left. Okay, so it's just the opposite. So why is that? Let's think about uh, this small code, right? It's where we just read some data and then 
we add it to value, right? So we data, in, we put that into D and then we add it. So once a thread has read the value and I put that in D, does it need to wait? Well, obviously on the CPU, all the threads are independent. And so you can, you know, you're not waiting. You're just going to keep executing. Now on the GPU, your threads are synchronized, right? They all have to execute the same instruction. And so what it means is all the threads in the WAP on the wavefront, uh, depend, the name is just, depends on if you're on G, uh, NVIDIA or a AMD GPU, you know, they all have to first load. Once they are done loading, now you can execute the next uh, instructions, right? So it works very differently. And so this is important on how you're going to be able to access the memory. So if you think about, you know, a CPU core, you have each core has its own cache, right? And so when, when you thread zero, you're going to do, you know, you read element zero, and then after that, you're going to read the next element and so on. And so you want, you know, you want to give a few few elements to thread zero, and then you will give a few other elements to thread one and so on. You don't want them to overlap. You want them to be able to work on their own, uh, on their own cache, you know, separately. Now on the GPU, it works very differently because there is, you know, the cache is shared between everybody. And so what you need to do, it's, Oh, sorry. You need to have thread zero needs to access element, you know, this element, and you want thread one to access the one next to it, and so on. And then when you go, uh, when you read the next element, then you'll have to really move the cache away, right? So the way the memory is accessed is totally different. CPU, each core has its own block on the GPU. You want all the elements, all the threads to access the element in, uh, next to each other, right? And so that's called being, you know, caching or coalescing. So on the CPU, you want to cache your memory. So if the thread T has access to position I, you also want it to be have access to, you know, to work on element I plus one. While when you're on the GPU, what you want the memory to be coalesced. That means that if the thread T is working on element I, you want the thread T plus one to work on the element I plus one, okay? And so if you don't do that, you will have huge performance hit, right? If uh, you start interleaving the memory uh, on this, you are coalescing the memory on the, on the CPU, you have all your cores are going to like, walk over each other and it's going to slow you down and on the gpu side then you'll have to uh, go through the cache lines everywhere and you'll have a lot of memory traffic again so now the question is okay i have something that's very simple it's a 1d array so i don't have this issue uh how is it going how is the memory access pattern going to be done right and so now if you have a thread, when you're on the CPU, what you want is give them access to the continuous element. You're going to give, say, okay, you walk from element uh, uh, zero to N over P. Well, if you're on the GPU, you're going to say, no, I want you to work on element zero, then N over P, then two N over P, right? So you want to this part, you want this pattern to be different depending on the CPU or the GPU. And obviously, this is what uh, Cocos does for you. So, yeah, like I just said, Cocos will map uh, the indices in the contiguous chunk on the CPU, and it will stride it for the GPU so that it always has the best access. So the rule of thumb is, no, if I have something, you know, here I have a tree let's say a 3D uh, array, where should I parallelize it, right? What's the best way? Should I parallelize on the last element, the middle, the leftmost? You should do it 
on the leftmost index. Right? That's how we assume you're using the code. So this is in general how you should do it. So let's just uh, think about uh, this, right? Let's say, let's get back to our inner product. How are we accessing uh, the memory? So just to remind you, we are uh, going to access, we parallelize on the row, right? Now, if the memory is a uh, layout right, this is going to mean that, okay, the first, I mean, thread zero has going to work on the first row and then thread one is going to work on the second row and so on. And so this is cache, this is great for the CPU, but it's going to be really bad for the GPU. Now we can do layout left. So this is the opposite. Uh, this is going to be great for the GPU, but it's going to be really bad for the uh, CPU, right? So what happens is when you're using Cocos, we will switch how we access, you know, we switch uh, the memory layout so that it's always optimal. When you're on the host, have the data is cached, which is good, and when you're on the uh, on CUDA, the memory is colorless, which is also good, right? This is something very important for performance, uh, and it's you know we it's everything is kind of hidden from you. We change that layout automatically. Uh, and so this is just back to the example. You see that we had good access when the memory is coalesced on the GPU and good uh, performance when the memory is cached on the GPU. Uh, okay, here just, I guess, uh, yeah, I think I will just uh, finish on this slide because it's, it's time. Um, so I went through the to the layout uh, pretty quickly. So the layout, you know, it decides how the memory is going to be um, aligned. You know, better for coalescing or maybe better for caching. Uh, this is very important, and this is what makes you know Cocos performance portable. If you need to be able to switch between these different layouts depending on the way. Uh, where you're running the code, right? And so if you have using OpenMP or something like that, or OpenACC, you're basically in charge or making sure that your layout matches what you need. Um, one last thing uh, before I stop here. Uh, uh, when you do have, like, what happens when you create a host mirror view, right? When you create a host mirror view, What's the layout that you're going to get? And you will get the layout of, let's say, the CUDA space, right? So you'll be on the GPU, but you create um, a mirror view from something that's on the GPU. You have the layout of the GPU, right? So that means that you will lose some performance. Uh, it's, you know, usually it's not a big deal because you use the host you just for IO, right? Uh, if you want to have the right um, layout, you basically need to create a new view and do a deep copy. So the, the reason why we do not change the layout when you create a mirror view, it's that cannot be done in one deep copy. You have to do it in two deep copies, right? So it's just something uh, I wanted to point out. And uh, yeah, I think it's time, so I will stop here.